Hello, investors, and welcome to our session here today. So it looks like the market's taking a nice little pop to the upside at the moment. You know, in these market conditions, we have some stocks that are moving up strongly, some stocks are moving down strongly. Over the last couple of weeks, we paid particular attention to historical yields and how historical yields can help us with regards to potentially entering stocks at low points and selling stocks at high points. This will be our third and final installment in discussing this particular customized strategy as we go in and we complete going through the code here today. So with that, let's go ahead and get underway. And to do that, we do wanna run through a few disclosures here. And just to remind our investors that Schwab does not recommend the use of technical analysis as a sole means of investment research. We do use the paper money software application here. This is for educational purposes only. We want to remember that successful vertical trading during one time period does not guarantee successful investing of actual funds during a later time period as market conditions do change continuously. And here we do a fair amount of thing scripting that does often involve back testing. Do keep in mind that back testing results presented are hypothetical. There is no guarantee the same strategy implemented today would produce similar results. And of course, past performance of any secured or strategy does not guarantee future results or success. So with that, let's just go ahead and jump right into our discussion here today. And to do that, I'm going to bring up the thinkorswim platform here. And we'll have it up here momentarily while that's coming up. Do you want to welcome everybody here? So welcome to uh, Duke. Duke Lou and David and Scott. Truth will always prevail. Tom, Manuel, Robert, so we have Michael Fairborn here with us in the chat. Great to have Mike here with us again today. Very knowledgeable investor. Do feel free to send your questions over there to Mike. So just a little bit of a review about this study for those of you that may not have been here in previous sessions, just a little bit of a heads up along with that. If this is your first time coming here um, over say the last three weeks, what you might wanna do is take a look at the archives because the archives for the two sessions leading up to this session will help to give you a stronger foundational uh, understanding of the customized study itself and also with regards to the first section of code in relationship to that, which we went through last week. But here, if you look down at the bottom of my chart, you can see I have this customized study called historical dividend yield. And basically what this is used to do, it's help us to identify from a historical standpoint whether or not the price the stock is currently trading at historically low levels in relationship to the yield or historically high levels in relationship to the yield. And you can see here with regards to Apple Computer, this is a long-term chart for Apple, by the way. You can see that if we go over here to where the price was the lowest, we can see the dividend yield was the highest. So that's something to take into consideration when looking at stocks. Maybe look at those stocks where the dividend yield is the highest because that tends to correlate to low stock prices. If we, if we look at possibly obtaining those stocks when the dividend low when the dividend yield is high and then as the price goes up that pushes the dividend yield low from a historical standpoint that might be a, a one of the considerations with regards to selling that particular security at that particular time i always do want to keep in mind though investors in looking at this and looking at these uh, looking at this type of an analysis the stocks that have relatively high dividend yields some of those create what's called a dividend trap that's a situation where the underlying stock has moved down because of some type of a difficulty within the company and there may be the possibility they will not be able to continue those dividends so there's a little bit more to look at than just the yield but but from a historical standpoint again most investors, I would say, particularly those who look at fundamentals, find it beneficial to see where the yield is at from a historical standpoint. And here we have Apple. We've used this as our example over the last couple of weeks. We'll continue to use it today. One of the reasons for that, if you look at this chart, by the way, this is a five-year chart that uses weekly candles. And do notice that here, part of this is we had a stock split here on Apple right here at this particular point in time. And that does involve some manipulation with regards to the underlying code. So with that, then let's go ahead and jump right back into the code. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and pull that up. But I, I say that I say that with with a little bit of a smile because <laughs> for some of you, I know that you enjoy the code, and that's why we always want to take a look at the code. But for some of you, I know that when we bring up the code, it's like your eyes glass over. Do keep in mind that, that this is not primarily a coding class, okay? This is primarily an application class. However, after we look at the application, we share links so the folks can use these things. We do like to take a look at the code related to that. Just a little bit of a heads up. If you're not interested in the code that much, I totally understand that. With regards to the link that you can use to, to bring over the historical dividend um, study, if you look at the bottom of your YouTube window, you'll see a description in there. And, and along with that description, I, I think YouTube usually puts the word more or all or something like that. When you click on that, that opens up a more detailed description. When you're looking at that more detailed description, you'll see in there links related to sessions. 
And under that, under that heading, you'll see a link that is called historical dividend yield. And you can simply use the link to bring the study over. Therefore, you can use the study. You don't need to get involved in all of the coding and those types of things in order to, in order to be able to use that study, okay? But here we have right here, this is just a Word document. And in this Word document, I pasted the code. Now, in, in our first session, which was two weeks ago, we devoted almost the entire session of just discussing the historical yield study, how to use it and how it would be applicable. The second week, which was last week, we started to get into the code. This is the Word document that we were looking at last week, okay? We went through the code and we got to the point where we went to the fold statement. I went through the fold statement relatively quickly, which is unfortunate because it's one of the more complicated statements. So what I've decided to do here today, take a step back and redo the fold statement discussion and continue to move through our code. I believe we have plenty of time here today. We should be able to complete all of the code with regards to the study, or, or should I, what I should say is a review of all the code as it relates to that study. So just to get that fold statement quickly, I'm gonna come over here on this little Word document and do a control F. And that puts me on fold and that brings us down to our fold statement right here. I'm gonna go ahead and collapse this. So let's start our discussion of the fold statement. Again, investors, this is a rather, this is one of the more complicated uh, statements uh, with regards to thing scripting. So I'm gonna go through this step by step just from a generic standpoint. And then also part of that generic standpoint will also bring in what the actual code entailed here as well. I'm gonna bring this guy down here. So we have a little bit more space up here with regards to our code. And let me just see if I can bring up a drawing tool here. Here is a drawing tool. And in that drawing tool, I'm going to grab this guy right here, this little square. I think that'll be good. And maybe I want to go with a little lighter line there in relationship to that. Okay, so many of you are seeing this saying, oh, yeah, I, I recognize that as a, think, as a think scripting statement. You know, we're starting off with, with DEF. That just means we're defining a variable. This little pound sign is just differentiating it. So it's, this is not actually part of the code. This is a note that is put in that is put inside of the code that doesn't have any impact. But this is kind of nice because you can put notes inside of your code that don't have any impact. We just kind of give you a heads up as far as what is actually going on here. But we start off here with a with saying what we want to do is we want to define a variable. The, the variable we have here, we can give this any name we want to. Right here, it has a sample as a result. Just ignore the carrots here on both sides of the on both sides of these things. The carrots is not part of the code. It's just identifying vari variables, variables that are variables that are put in here. Okay, so there is that's our first item right there. Is we give the variable a name, and in our fold statement, the name we decided to give it was trailing twelve months underscore dividend. That's what that's that's the name that we decided to give our fold statement. So when this whole fold statement is calculated, the last value that the fold statement comes up with will be assigned to our result right here. And, and, the, and the name that we've chosen for our variable here as that result is trailing 12 months dividend. Then we start here with the, with the crux of it. Um, we start off with the word fold and that's actually how you wanna type it is fold. Then we need to create a variable for the name of what's called the index, okay? And that's this guy right here. Let me just come around there, okay? So what happens on a fold statement is a fold statement does several different iterations. And with each one of those iterations, the value of this index changes. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna give a name for that index value and keep in mind that this index value can be used in later parts of the statement. So in our situation here, what we decided to use for the, for the, for the name of the index right here is I just, just, I just decided to use I for index. You can use I, J, C, P. You can use anything you want to, or you can use a more extended name. You could, you could call it index if you wanted to. This is just a value. This, this is a value that's going to change as the iterations go on. Well, then you need to determine on the fold statement how many iterations you want to do. And so to do that, you need to put a starting value here. In other words, what's going to be the starting value of the index? And then you need to put an ending value here. That's going to be the ending value of the index if all of the iterations are completed, but all of the iterations aren't necessarily going to be completed. And the reason for that is you control how many iterations, how many iterations are actually completed here on the full statement. You could have here, for example, you, you, you could have here one, you could have here one and 500, depending on what happens over here in the expression, you may go through 10 of those 500 or you may go through the entire 500. So on our sample statement right here, we've got here fold, 
I've got iterations from zero to 260. The reason I've got from zero to 260 right here is because there's 252 days typically in the trading year. So if you look at a typical chart and you want to go back a year, well, you'd want to go back to you'd want to go back to 252. Why do I have 260 here? Uh, call me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the reality is you probably only need two, 252, maybe, maybe, maybe 253, but I just put in there 260 just to make sure that I got everything there. Okay. So the first iteration, the first time, the, the first iteration that we use with regards to our expression right here, this index is going to be at zero, then it's going to go to one, then it's going to go to two, then it's going to go to three, as, as high as this thing goes, depending on the number of iterations that are done. I just have zero, I just have zero to 260 or so. If an entire year is needed, it's able to easily go out the entire year. So keep in mind that this changes, okay, this changes with each iteration that is done in relationship to our expression here, okay? Now, as those iterations are done, okay, as we're going through and we're doing these iterations with regards to our expression right here, we can store the value after each iterations in a secondary variable. And that's gonna be this variable right here. Okay, so let's go ahead and highlight this guy right there. All right, so now we're, we're basically identifying another variable, but this variable is primarily aligned with the inside operation of the fold statement. So each time, the, each time we have an iteration, the value of this variable can change. What is the, and, with, and, and with regards to the name that you choose for this variable, you can put in any name there you want. You can do Tom, Jack, Joe, whatever you want to. The name that I chose for the variable is right here is S. So we're saying with S, that's going to be the variable that we're going to be using here. And I just had to check my phone here real quick. Some, sometimes I get a call from folks in technology and say, hey, Ken, your computer's not working, but that's not where that call's coming from, so that's a good thing. All righty, so here is our variable right here. And again, I've given it the name of S. What we're saying here is that with this variable S, we want to do something. Now, another nice thing about this is we can assign this variable an initial value. And so we, 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 identify our, we identify our variable, then we give it an initial value. And in our situation here, we gave it the initial value of zero. So our variable was S, we initialized it to its beginning value of zero, okay? So that is that part of it, okay? So that's that part of the full statement. Then we come over here and say, okay, when we're doing these iterations, and these iterations, by the way, are going to involve this expression right here. So each time the expression is done, it's going to update the value here in variable. The variable, this, the, the initial value right here in variable, in other words, S is gonna be zero. Each time an iteration is done, this value can change. Now what we can say here is we can have a while statement, which basically says this, while the value of this variable is at a certain point, continue to do the expression. But when the value of that variable exceeds this certain point or, 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 or goes down below a certain point, then we can stop the iterations right here. And so what we're talking about here, here's our variable here again. It's S equals zero. What we're saying here is that while S is less than 400, do the iteration here. In other words, do the expression here. So while S is 400, go ahead and do the expression, which basically means do the iterations, okay? So we're, so we're gonna come down here now and look at our code here in relationship to what is the expression we're doing down here. And keep in mind that what we're saying is we wanna go ahead and do this expression while S is less than 400. Okay, so let me just see if I can then. I'm gonna, we're gonna erase some stuff here and let's get rid of our notes here for just a second. And let's scroll down and look at the, here's the do and here's our stuff here now. Some of you remember from last week, we talked about the fact that Apple had a split. So let's come up here and just identify that. I'm gonna come down here a little bit. I wanna keep my do on there. All right, looks like we're good there. So notice right here that Apple had a four for one split. Because of the nature of how the thinkorswim charts work, it requires us to make an adjustment to all of the dividends that occurred before that split because the charts make an adjustment in price, 
but they don't make an adjustment for dividends. For example, typically what you'll see, if a stock has a, has a four to one stock split, the dividend's gonna be approximately one fourth of what it was before the stocks. But notice right here, these dividends are staying here at $5, $3 and so on and so forth. And then the dividends drop down here, okay? But they don't drop before this. So we need to make an adjustment in our calculation in relationship to these dividends in order to bring it in alignment with our stock split. And again, we went into some detail with that in our last session. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go over it uh, generally here. But as I go over this whole stock split thing, you may say, hey, wait a minute, Ken, you didn't really explain that. Well, the reason for that is because we explained it in detail in our last session, all right? So here we have our do right here. We're, we're, we're ready to do this expression. How many times are we gonna do this expression? We're gonna do this expression until the value of S is greater than 400, okay? So here's here's our expression. If get value of dividends, we want to we want to look at a we want to look at a bar or candle on this or bar or candle on the chart, and see if there's a dividend there. This is just a standard thinks thinks group statement right here. We're going to we're going to tell the statement which bar to look at by using this i right here. What is the i? That i, if you remember, that's our index. So the first time this goes around, it's gonna look at dividend on zero. That's gonna be the current bar. The next time it's gonna be the number one, that's gonna be the previous bar. Then the number two, previous bar, excuse me, then, then the number two, that's, that's gonna be two bars away and so on and so forth. So each time we have this iteration, it's, it's gonna go back in time and it's going to look to see if there's a dividend and it's going to eat, and each time there's an iteration, it's going to look at a candle that's going back further and further and further in time. Now, if the value is zero, okay, then what do we do? Well, if the value is zero, and let me, I may have to, let me pull this out a little bit, make sure we got everything. If, if the value is zero, then take the S. If you remember, what is the S? The S is our variable right here. Remember, we initialized it to zero. Take that S, which is initialized to zero, add zero to it. In other words, we're not changing the value. So if it looks at one of the bars on the chart, no dividend, it just leaves that S at zero. Else, okay, else if, if this is not equal to zero, that means, that means we have a dividend. So now it's else, then we, then we have to ask ourselves the question, do we have a split? Now, again, we talked about splits in detail last time, okay? Else, and notice this is in pound signs. It's just, just, this is just me putting notes in here, okay? Else, okay, else, if, if we do have a split, that's just identifying whether, whether or not we have a split, and not only is it asking whether or not we have a split, and the bar number is less than the bar number of the split. In other words, all the way back here, if we have a split and the bar number that it's looking at are these bars here, then we need to make an adjustment to that split, right? We need to make our adjustments. So if, if, if we have a split and we're looking at the bar number before that split, then we need to decrease the dividend using the split ratio match. We talked about that last time. And so here's our math on that. We take our S, we have a dividend, okay? We have our dividend, but we're sitting and we're looking at those dividends before the stock splits. We need to make an adjustment. We have our dividend. First thing, we're gonna take our S and we're gonna add 100 to it. Why are we adding 100? Because typically what you'll be looking at, if you're looking at dividend yields, is you're gonna be looking at four quarterly dividends that are paid, which brings up an important point. This study will not function correctly if the dividends that come out, come out in a time frame that is not over four quarters, okay? Now, most stocks have dividends that come out over four quarters, but if you have a situation where you have a stock, maybe it pays a special dividend that is, that, is, that is out of sequence, then this historical dividend yield is not going to function properly. So keep in mind, most stocks, it's gonna work out just fine, but if you do have a stock that has possibly a special dividend that occurs rarely, but it does occur, or a stock that, they're, that the nature of the way they pay dividends is different from paying four quarters over the course of the year, then this will not function correctly. But what we're doing is, is we're, each time we find a dividend, we're, we are adding 100 to S, okay? So if we go back and we, if we, if we go back and there are four dividends, if, and, there are, there are, and, there are, and there are four dividends, then what's gonna happen? Well, then this is gonna go up by 100, then 200, 300, then it's gonna get, then it's gonna get to 400, 
And when it gets to 400, it's not only going to have these $100 values, but it's going to have the values of the dividends here added as well. So there's the dividend we take, we add 100 S plus we get the value of the dividend. In this case, because, because we're talking about the dividends over here, we're applying the split ratio. So, so rather than adding the actual dividend, we've made an adjustment here. So we're taking this and we're having the dividend that's adjusted for the split ratio added to S, okay? Else, now at this particular point in time, what do we know? Well, we know there is a dividend, okay? And we know that it is, that there's not a dividend split if we're, if we're coming down here to else. So else, now I, now I just have my pound signs here. Now we're looking at if there's not a split else, just take S plus 100 and then just get the dividend, okay? And here we are on, on I again. So what this does investors is, is this goes back and it, it does these iterations. It can go back as far as 260. The reality is it, it's usually not gonna need to go back nearly that far, but it does have capability to do that. But what it does, it basically adds up the dividends for the previous four quarters and has that dividend available to you so that you can apply a dividend yield down here from a historical standpoint. So right here, it's gonna go back four quarters. It's gonna go back right here. It's gonna go back four quarters. So it's basically, as we're going along this chart, it, it is, it's giving us a running value, the trailing 12 months of dividends, okay? And with that trailing 12 months of dividends, we can calculate the yield. By the way, this is not the dividends. This is the dividend yield. So it's taking the trailing 12 months of dividends, it's dividing it by the current price to get our dividends down here, okay? All right, so moving right along here then, let's go ahead and move through. What I wanna do is I, I wanna make sure we get through all of our code here. By the way, I do have a, um, a, another show and tell uh, to share with you here today. Um, many of you are familiar with uh, Chess Dog. He has provided some stuff here for us in the past. He's made a little bit of an update to a custom column that's related to trend. I wanna have enough time to be able to share that with all of you as well, okay? But coming down over here then, we've got trading 12 month dividend yield for the current bar. It's pretty straightforward dividend yield. We have the trading 12 months of the dividend, okay? Minus 400, right? So we need to take, remember that number is, is each time that S increase in value. Oh, by the way, one other, one other thing that I think is important, I wanna, I wanna touch upon this because this also is absolutely, you know, it's helpful to understand the, the fold command, just keep this in mind. So this variable right here, the last value that it has is automatically assigned to this one right here, okay? So the last value, when all the calculations are done on this, this value is assigned to result, okay? So, the, so at, at, at the end of the iterations that are done, this value, if the company pays dividends, is going to be 400, and so, 400 plus, whatever the dividends are, and so that's what the result's gonna be right here. And so when we come down here and we put that dividend out here, right here, we need to take that trailing 12 months dividends, anyway, we need to minus the 400, okay? That puts us down just to the dividends. We divide that by the closing price. That gives us a percentage. Then we times it by 100, just so it looks a little bit better rather than 0.0246, it's 2.46%, okay? So that is our dividend yield right there. And then here we have defined yield, no yield, okay? If, if, if the dividend yield is greater than zero, then that means that we do have a yield. If that's not greater than zero, then that means that we, that we don't have a yield. This is just gonna be helpful to us when we decide whether or not we wanna plot something here. Then here we are as far as plotting, okay? So we wanna plot the dividend yield. If we do have a dividend yield, then plot the dividend yield, else don't plot anything zero. That's just a plot statement down here. And I believe this is related to this line right here. That's basically our dividend yield going across there over time. Then we wanna plot the highest and lowest to identify the percentages, because notice right here, and we've talked about this in previous discussions, where are we from a percentage standpoint in relationship to the dividend yield? Are we, are we at the 80 percentile? Uh, we're currently, the high, the high dividend yield on this chart is 2.46%. It looks like the low is, I'm not sure. Oh, there's the low. I, I was getting through. The low there is 0.48. I think that's probably pretty close to where we're at right now because Apple's gone up in price as much as it has. The current is at 0.49. So yeah, right now, Apple's dividend yield is, is almost at the five-year low, <laughs> which isn't too unexpected because the underlying price of the security has moved up as dramatically as it has, okay? So coming along there, then we've got our... 
Let's see, there's our plot. There's our applied dividend yield. Then we come down here. So we wanted to find the highest all yield. By the way, investors, anytime you use these two commands right here, highest all and lowest all, these suck up a whole bunch of computer resources. So if you do some coding and you get an error message that says, hey, you know what, your code has exceeded the, has exceeded the, the capabilities or whatever, something like this, you might, want to you might want to revisit highest all and lowest all and see if there's a way around those. If you can use them though, without running into an error, they are, they are fantastic to use because they're very easy. This is just saying, hey, find me the highest dividend yield on the chart, find me the lowest dividend yield on the chart. That gives you the number and we can use those in relationship to our highs and our lows here with regards to plotting those, okay? Then you come down here and this is just defining, is defining the, uh, the, the difference that is used in the calculation. Because notice on our chart here, We've got, you know, it's interesting. I've got, I'm, I, I probably want to come back in here and change the weight of this line here so it equals the weight of this line. We'll do that after our discussion here. But down here, we're just, we're just doing some math here to identify where this line appears. Because this line, if you'll notice, it doesn't appear all the way up here. It appears 20% below the high and it appears 20% above the low. So this is the range that we're looking at in determining whether or not we're at the higher end of the spectrum or, or whether or not we are, we are at the lower end of the spectrum. Now you get to choose where this line is going to be in the code if you want to. The default here is 20% above and 20% below. But as we talked about in a previous discussion earlier in the code, there's a place to put in there, overbought, oversold. In fact, what you do is go up in the code and just look for over, overbought, sold percentage, whatever value you put in there, that will come into play whether or not you're 20% 20, 20 or eight or, or 10% or 5% or wherever you want to put that, okay? Then we come over here and we have the year, the current yield percentile. This is just basically telling us right here, this is our current percentile right here. This is the math related to that, defined percentile, equals, we're taking the dividend yield minus the lowest all. So we're taking the dividend yield that we currently have minus the lowest all on the chart. We're dividing that by the, by the, by the difference between the high and the low. Okay, that's going to give us the percentile of where the dividend yield is in relationship to the range right here. We multiply that by 100, we take that out by two digits there as well. So that's just defining something here, this percentile, okay? And then later on, we will plot it. Now, investors, when you look at this, one of the things that you'll notice is that um, I kind of break this up into little blocks. And when you're looking at this, you might say, hey, you know what, Ken, we could have actually defined the percentile as part of the plot statement that is using that percentile. And that's absolutely true under almost all circumstances, okay? So you're looking at it and say, hey, you could do this and shorten up the code. I totally understand that, okay? But in order to make it a little bit more uh, fluid from, from a teaching perspective, I, I've chosen to broke things up a little bit. Also, just a little bit of a heads up as well. We do have a few um, coders in here that have, that have more experience in coding than I do. And they will frequently look at something like this and say, you know what, Ken? Uh, this may be a little bit of a cleaner way to do this. I totally welcome that, okay? In fact, on this code here, I know that, uh, I, I don't know if Chess Dog or, or uh, Mbox or um, uh, Robert or some of the other ones have provided help in here. If you, if you look at the beginning of the code, I usually put the folks' names here that have, that, that, that have contributed to this. So if you're seeing something here and you're a coder and you say, hey, you know what, this would actually look a little bit smoother or, or we may want to add this, we may want to add this. I'm totally open to that feel free to send that information over to me. I'll take a look at it. I need to run it through a couple of approval processes, but I'm usually able to bring it back here and share those improvements with everyone, okay? All right, so coming coming right down here, I'm just looking over here, we're getting close to the bottom. <laughs> so now we have, so we have plot the high yield line. So that's, that's, that's gonna be this line right here, okay? So if we do have a yield, then we, then we have the highest all minus the difference. So we're starting up here at the highest all minus the difference. That's gonna plot that line right there. Then we have, then right here, we're, then right here we are setting a default color for that. The default color is light green, it looks like right here. You can go in and change those colors though. There's that high yield line. When we come to here, plot the low yield line, that's gonna be this line right here. First of all, do we have a yield? If we do, then take the lowest and add the difference that we wanna use in relationship to there, else plot zero. And that's gonna be our, and then, and then we have here, what have we got here? Um, low yield line, set default color, that's gonna be green. So both of these, it looks like the default color on those is green. Looks like I may have changed it, but I didn't change the width of that one. Okay, then we come down here to some labels, all right? And the labels are these three labels right here, okay? 
this one's kind of got there. We take that off. So these these are the labels we're looking at. So um, ad label um, is percentile a number. Notice that this is is not a number, but there's an a, there is an explanation point below be before that which changes the meaning. Now instead of saying is not a number, we're saying is it a number? A percentile is and show labels because you can go in and change this and determine. You may not want to have these labels here. You just might want to look at the graph. That that's something going and change and show labels is on, and yield no no yield. In other words, we do have a yield. Okay, then. We want to put in there dividend yield percentile. Here it is right here, dividend yield percentile. And we want to put in the actual percentile. And there's the actual percentile right there. And it looks like we are, we're just running out of a little bit of room here. I wonder if I made my chart a little bit bigger, but that should be zero point something because we are at the very, very low end of the of the percentile. In fact, rounded, maybe it's just zero because we are at we're at the very low there. Okay. Then we actually then we want to put in the actual percentile. Um, if dark mode is chosen, because you can set this up, so it's, so it's so you're looking at a dark mode. In other words, if you use Think or Swim under a dark environment, then at the beginning you can you can go into dark mode. If that's the case, then then we want to use a color of light red here. Okay. Um, else, if you're not in dark mode, then we're okay with using a dark red color, which is right there. So that's that label right there. Um, how are we doing on time? Well, it looks like we're doing pretty good on time. Okay. Um, have that right there, and then if if is if is dark mode plus oh then I have a little comma right here if is dark mode then color light green dark green and here's another label right here okay so here's another label if again we're saying add label the first part of an add label statement is you can you can put in here um, you you can put in here some uh, some terms here. That are either true or false, and if and if they're all true and false, then I'll go ahead and do it. Otherwise, 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 the label won't show up. Okay, I was saying here. Okay, so what I was saying here: Do we have a dividend yield? And is show labels on? If yes, and and is the yield no yield? Is that also correct? Then we can use current, which C is for current, and that's just going to give our current dividend yield right there. So pretty much a mirror image of the one that is above that. Okay, and then we have um, here's our. High all, show labels, no all labels. This is going to be the highest value. So that's going to be our H value right here. That puts that label in there along with those colors to go along with that. And then add label, okay? Right here we have yield, no yield. Now yield, no yield is going to be true if we have a dividend yield. It's going to be false if we don't have a yield. I've got the explanation point ahead of this. So this is saying actually if we don't have a yield here, then the label we want to put in here is just does not pay dividends. So if the company did not pay dividends and down in this area right here, it would just say does not pay dividends. Okay, investors. And that is our code. All right. We have completed going through that code along with a discussion of the, um, the uh, along with a little bit more of a discussion with regards to the fold statement. Okay. So before we shift basis here, because I do want to go over and take a look at that trend study. Here in just a moment, but I also want to come down here and just fix our line right here. So let me come over here and choose studies and edit studies. And here's historical. I'm just going to click on the gear here. And notice on the gear, I've got labels turned on. I've got the, the oversold percentage I use is 20. So we're coming down. There's 80 and there's 20 right there. Is in dark mode. I've got no because I use it in light mode. But my high yield line, the, the plot dividend is two. That's a two weight right there and it's green. The high yield line here is a one, okay? And I wanna change that width here to two. I wanna go ahead and leave that as black. The low yield line is two. I'm go ahead and I'm okay leaving that as black. So that takes that up, we'll say apply here. And that just looks a little bit cleaner and a little bit better in relationship to that. Okay, so I wanna come over here and take a quick peek over in the chat window. But before I do, one, one other message here, investor, and that's this. The, the code here for historical dividend yield, again, Bottom of the YouTube window, there's a short description. If you don't have this already, click on more, click on all, it'll open up. Go down in that description, you'll see a section that says links directly related to sessions and go down underneath that and you'll see a link there for historical dividend yield. You can use that to bring it up, to bring it over here to the Thinkorswim platform. Also, while we're talking about that window over there, if you haven't done it all, if you haven't done it yet, I would strongly encourage you to click on subscribe by subscribing to the Trader Talks channel, that just helps you to keep up with the with the latest and the greatest. Another thing, I actually had an excellent suggestion in relation to that. 
And that's it. When you look at, you can look at where the price is currently at and you can say, okay, if the yield was at a, was, what if the yield was at a historical high, where would the price be? And what if the yield was at a historical low, where, where would the price be? Because that can be helpful information. And it's not too much of a stretch to do that. So I actually plan on playing around with that a little bit, kind of see what it looks like and see how, would, how, would, how it would be applicable. And that would involve then upgrading this one to an upgrade. And again, by kind of tuning in to the, uh, by, by, being a, by being subscribed to Trader Talks now, it kind of helps you to keep up with things. You'd probably be in a better place in order to catch that update. When and if, and I always choose if because I'm not sure exactly how that, how that would look, but when and if that's done, it does sound like a good idea to me though, but when and if that's done, I can go ahead and show that to you, okay? So let me just do one other thing here though before I leave this, because I do like to give props to those folks that help out with this stuff. So just come back up here. So on this one, um, Mbox56, a big thanks again. Uh, Chess Dog as well. By the way, you can, you can catch Chess Dog on Twitter here. And so it looks like Mbox56 and Chess Dog were helpful as far as fine tuning some stuff over on this one already. So big thanks on that. All right, investors. So let me do, let me just take a quick peek over there in the chat window, because sometimes there's things that I can help out in way of questions where Mike doesn't have advantage of having the platform there. It looks like Mike's been doing a great job of taking care of all of you. And it looks like some good, good constructive chat over there. And it looks like maybe some questions on exporting and the different scripts and whatnot. We just touch upon that just a little bit, okay? Um, if you're not familiar with the scripting, once you have the link, it's uh, to bring it over here as a to bring it over here as a functional study. Just come up here to setup. If you're open shared item, by the way, you can paste the entire link in here. Paste the entire link in here. Click on preview. There'll be a box that comes up. In that box will be a place to give a name. You definitely want to give it a name so that you can find it. After you give it the name, go ahead and click on import. Then it should be available to you. Just another little thing we have to deal with during this, during this whole merger thing. If a link is shared to you from, from, a, from the thinkorswimschwab.com platform, it will not function on the old Thinkorswim platform. And right now, a lot of folks are currently moving over to Thinkorswim by schwab.com. Having said that, whoever provides you with that link most likely can also provide you with the actual code. They can provide you with the code and then with that code, you can move it over to um, your Thinkorswim platform. It's a little bit of a different process, but that can be done if you have the code just to, um, how are we doing on time? Tell you what, let me do this. Let me go, let me go ahead and share this um, customized column right here. And we'll talk about this just a little bit. And then we'll talk, and then if I've got some time, we'll go out and talk about sharing things via code. If we don't get on that this week, I'll look forward to doing that this next week. So this is a trend column right here, investors. And that right here, I have the S&P 500. And you can see how the S&P 500, I've got several stocks that would be possibly considered to be in bearish trends and several S&P 500 stocks. In fact, more because the market's primarily been bullish, it would be considered to be in bullish trends. Now, when this code was originally written, we basically had, um, bullish or bearish, I believe some or something along those lines, or, or basically just a red or a green. I'm not sure exactly how it was constructed. But what this does is it looks for stocks, okay, where it, it uses two moving averages. It uses a 20 moving and uses a 20 period moving average and a 50 period moving average. And some of you may be saying, hey Ken, why don't you use the 50 and 200? Everybody else does. Well I understand that and I'm not saying that everybody else does, okay. But we're looking at things a little bit more from a momentum standpoint also in relationship to trend, and I'll show you where we've, we've addressed the momentum and the trend, then some investors tend to gravitate towards the 20 and the 50 rather than the 50 and 200. However, if you're more comfortable with 50 and 200, it's not that, it's not that big of a stretch to go ahead and customize this so you're looking at the 50 and 200, but purpose of here, we're using, we're using the 20 and the 50, okay? So what is going on right here? By the way, I'm gonna change my chart here because on our chart here, we're looking at a five-year weekly when you're using this customized column, it assumes you're using a chart that has a one day aggregation, not a weekly aggregation. So I'm gonna come up here and change this. And I'm gonna to go to a one day aggregation. And let's just go with, I don't think we need to go out more than three months. So there we are right there. Okay, so here's stock. Let's go ahead and pull up an example stock here. We'll go ahead and pull up EOG right here. Okay, now what this is saying, because the square is red, 
this means that this would be considered to be in a bearish in a bearish trend. And what that means is this. It means that the faster moving average, which is the 20, is below the 50, number one. And then number two, the distance between the 20 and the 50 is increasing. So with regards to the moving average crossing below here, that's an indication of a change in momentum. With regards to the distance increasing between those two, that, that lends, us, that's lends itself more to a change in overall trend, okay? So that's the parameters. Now, the nice little thing here, we have an additional number right here, which is 23. What the 23 is telling us is that if we go back the previous 30 trading days, over the previous 30 trading days, the stock has closed below the 50, 23 out of those previous 30 trading days, okay? Now, notice that these numbers change over time. So these are all 23s. We come down here. Let's go to a little bit of a shorter time frame. How about 10? So this one down here, PXD, this would technically be considered to be in a bearish trend based on our parameters. By the way, keep in mind that thing scripting is not perfect. It's not guaranteed with regards to accuracy or timing and those types of things. It tends to do a helpful job. It's definitely not perfect, okay? Let's go ahead and pull up PXD here and open this one up, okay? So you can see that. Here we have the red has crossed below the cross this faster moving average of 20 has crossed below the 50. The distance between the two is widening out. But if we look over the past 30 days, we've only been below the 50 for 10 of those past 30 days. It looks like we're kind of bouncing up, up. Uh, we're basically bouncing above it and below it over that period of time right there. Okay, so that is again. Uh, a nice little helpful column if you want to pull it up. It kind of helps you. It kind of helps you to look at stocks quickly. I like having the days there as well. If we come down here, we're looking at bullish. So here we have. Uh, why don't we look at SYF here from a bullish standpoint? We can see that you know this 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 is saying nine over the last thirty trading days. Well, it's probably the last nine days. Okay. <laughs> what do we got? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. And well, yeah, you know, I don't know. You know, this this may be something to possibly look at and gauge the accuracy of it. I don't know. I don't know if we have a certain percentage that needs to be above it or below it. That is a possibility. Okay, but you can see that you know, a big move up here. We can see this, but over over a short time, if you look at it, over the last thirty days, you know, here we're primarily down below it. Okay, and then and and then a big explosion. Let's look for something over a longer period of time. There, here we'll come down here and look at some larger numbers. Kind of look at something at the other end of the spectrum right here. Yeah, and how are we doing on time? Okay, I've just got the, the heads up here, folks. Now let's see. My, oops. Let's take a look at an 18 day one here, okay? Okay, and this is, yeah, so we, we can kind of see our last three days. So this is primarily above the 50. In a, in a trend over a longer period of time. You can come in here and take a look at the code and do feel free to work with this code any way that you like, okay? This, all, this, all the stuff that I share in here, you do wanna feel free to work in. Right. There's that one as well. If you, bottom of the YouTube window again, click on more, click on all, open it up, look at the detail, go down to where it says links directly related to sessions. This will actually be the first one under that link because this is gonna be the one that was added the most recently. Do give it about, I would say, I would say two to three hours following our session because that's how long it takes before the updates we put in there are actually posted. So do give a little bit of a time for those to show up. All right, let's see how we did here for today, okay? And just, just a little bit of a heads up, folks. You can follow me on Twitter or I should say X. You can follow me on X. My X handle is at Ken Rose. Yes, I do post things on X occasionally in relationship to think scripting, mostly updates and things like that. As well as as well as interesting things with regards to what's currently going on in the market. Also encourage you to follow Mike on Twitter. His excuse me on X. His X handle is going to be at Mike Fairborn CS. I'm sure he'd be more than happy to send that over to you in the chat window. Also, do circle your calendar for Monday. Mike teaches an excellent covered calls and short puts. That's each Monday at 2 p.m. All right. So what do we want to do here today, investor? We basically wanted to review the custom scripts here that, that, that we did. We want to basically come in there and take a look at the code. I think we did a, a nice thorough job in doing that. It took us a couple sessions, but I'm okay with that. Next time we'll be looking and moving on to something else. We may have a little bit of an update to this one, then we'll look to move on to something else. By the way, if there's something that you would like to do in Think Scripting, 
do send me a direct message over there on Twitter. I'll be honest with you, I read all of them, okay? But I'm not able to apply all of them. But if you've got something there, the nice thing about having a few comments as far as what you'd like to do, some of those comments are very closely related and that kind of, that kind of gives me some, some direction with regards to some of the other things that, that, that I might want to that or, or that would be um, good to apply with regards to future sessions, okay? Hi, everybody. Thanks again for joining us here today for ThinkScript. I hope you have a fantastic day, a wonderful evening, a wonderful, a wonderful weekend, and a fantastic holiday. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, however you choose to, however you choose to celebrate it. I hope you have a great holiday season here. Again, a big thanks to Mike for helping us out in the chat window, and we'll catch y'all. Bye, everybody. Hope to see you again next week. We'll see you.